So I think we have got then a message from the poem. I don't think the poem was created to give us that message, but I think the interest of the last poet of Gilgamesh was very much in using the story of Gilgamesh as a vehicle for understanding the human condition. And out of it, then, we get this idea coming very strongly that what the individual does is not important. The important thing is the community, the society of human beings. And I think it's this, not only this idea, but also the, all the other ideas in the poem about what it is to be human as opposed to being an animal, what it is to be human as opposed to being a god, what it is to be a king. All these ideas demonstrate a, a, a great intellect at work who knows how to embed thoughts about the human condition into a great story drawn from folklore. And this, I think, explains why the great epic of Gilgamesh, 4,000 years old, when it was rediscovered and became known generally to more than a seriologist in the early 20th century, it took off and took on a life of its own and has been the inspiration of artists and musicians and librettists and dramatists and poets who have not stayed faithful to the epic of Gilgamesh, but created Gilgamesh among us. And of course, Assyriologists hate this because we think we are the gatekeepers of the epic of Gilgamesh. And if you are going to engage with the epic of Gilgamesh, you should do it through our work. But of course, it's too late. The cat got out of the bag a long time ago. Thank you very much for listening. This is a difficult act to follow. I'm Peter Machinist, one of the local residents. And with really great thanks and admiration for this discerning lecture that Andrew George has just given us, I make bold to offer a few remarks. They have to do with the interplay of kingship and immortality in the standard Akkadian version of the Gilgamesh epic. For me, the epic moves through a number of stages in which immortality may be conceived, only to reconfigure, even to undermine, and so to reject them one by one. Let me be more specific. The story begins, as we've heard, with a prologue that refers to the wall of Uruk that Gilgamesh constructed and the city of Uruk itself. And then in a Neo-Assyrian version on a tablet found at Nimrud, with a further reference to the tablet box, Akkadian Pishanu, deposited at the base of the wall with a text about Gilgamesh's exploits. But at that point in the story, the significance of the wall and the tablet with respect to immortality remains fully to be disclosed. Moving on, the story focuses on the great adventures of Gilgamesh and his buddy Enkidu, in defeating and killing Humbaba, the monster guarding the cedar forest, and then killing the bull of heaven. But if these achievements are, or, or were intended to win Gilgamesh and Enkidu a kind of deathless fame, they are quickly compromised by the disaster that follows with the goddess Ishtar. Later comes Gilgamesh's heroic journey to find the flood hero, Utanapishtim, in order to gain the personal immortality that the latter had been awarded by the gods. But here too, as we've heard, the end is in failure, and the failure is only compounded by a second defeat, namely of Gilgamesh's ability to hold on to the consolation prize of a plant that would rejuvenate him. To be sure, at the end of the basic story of the epic, that is, at the end of Tablet 11, we've seen the scene of the wall of Uruk and of the city itself returns. And this reappearance of the wall and the city after their mention at the very beginning of the epic reveals their significance. For they look like the answer to the running issue of immortality. Immortality presented now not as a personal deathlessness, but as the survival of the physical structure that in this instance Gilgamesh leaves behind. Yet even this answer is not a final one. 
Indeed, it is undermined and in two ways. First, it's followed by an additional tablet in the first millennium standard version of the epic, namely tablet 12. This offers a picture of the underworld from the mouth of Enkidu, who's now in it, a picture anticipated by Enkidu's second dream in tablet 7, rather broken at this point. In this picture, the dead-like Enkidu do survive, sort of, in a kind of afterlife, but the place in which they dwell, the underworld, is horrific, too awful to endure, let alone to contemplate, and so completely undesirable. The underworld, in short, is hardly a solution to the question of immortality. Second, if the reappearance of the wall in the city of Uruk at the end of Tablet 11 forces us back to the wall in Uruk at the beginning of Tablet 1, that return, at least in the Nimrud Neo-Assyrian version of Tablet 1, does not stop with the wall, but takes us, as we have seen, to the tablet box at the base of the wall. Inside, the tablet of Gilgamesh's exploits now gains a new significance, for its contents show that it is not just any account, but as uh, colleagues of ours, Piotr Michałowski and Christopher Walker have proposed, it's nothing less than the Gilgamesh epic itself. In other words, according to this Neo-Assyrian version, it is not simply the wall and city of Uruk that constitute uh, Gilgamesh's immortality, that immortality is ultimately to be sought in the survival of the story about the search for immortality, which is the Gilgamesh epic. The epic thus, here with some genuflection to Shakespeare, is about itself and implicitly its survival, its immortality. And yet even this is not the end, for we must now ask what kind of immortality does this epic about an epic represent? It is certainly not the personal one that Gilgamesh seeks. And if the epic stands as an impersonal immortality, then what it offers, what it is consumed by, is but the fruitless search for a happy personal survival. Even more, if at the end of the epic story we are brought back to the beginning, it is only to start this fruitless search all over again. Thus, a continuous feedback loop that leads nowhere a veritable Groundhog Day with Gilgamesh, none other than Bill Murray. <laughs> Two conclusions, I think, can be drawn from this analysis. The first is that the quest for the meaning of immortality in the Gilgamesh epic is a continuous one across the history of the composition of the epic, moving through the successive versions of the Akkadian epic, as each of these versions added to, qualified, even subverted the views of the versions that had come before. The second conclusion is that taken as a whole, this quest for meaning throws real doubt on kingship as represented by Gilgamesh and immortality, or put otherwise on kingship and divinity, thus on divine kingship. The background here was brilliantly illuminated by the late William Moran of Harvard's Near Eastern Department, one of the great connoisseurs of the Gilgamesh epic. In a letter to me several decades ago, and I haven't found this in his published studies, but someone may know of it. In this letter, he argued that the epic, beginning with its old Babylonian Akkadian version, was intended to sound the death knell of the tradition of divine kingship, as exemplified by the old Akkadian kings from Naram Sin and the Ur III kings from Shulgi. And that appears to me absolutely right. The Gilgamesh epic, in sum, is not only an epic about itself, but an epic that undermines itself. Thank you. Hi, I'm David Damrush from Comparative Literature. As we can see, in Andrew George, we have not only the world's greatest authority on Gilgamesh, but also some of the great literary insight and poetic sensibility. And I think, uh, really, Andrew, you don't need to despair on behalf of the archaeologists, because as you yourself show us, we moderns need your work in order to understand uh, the text and get the most out of it. And I think also understanding this message today, it helps a lot to understand as best we can what it meant to ancient audiences, so far as we can reconstruct that. Uh, and to build on Peter Machina's discussion of kingship and, and Gilgamesh, I thought I would talk about uh, Enkidu, 
uh, particularly in the, that pivotal episode of the cedar forest. And if we go back to uh, what we have from uh, ancient Near East, in particular the incredible uh, funds, uh, finds in, in Assyria, Nineveh, where the best preserved tablets of Gilgamesh are found, uh, we can learn a lot. This, uh, this expedition to, um, uh, to, to, to get uh, cedar uh, was, was a, a major economic and political activity of ancient monarchs. You needed good lumber, and it was hard to find. And Mesopotamia had to go someplace. Uh, so uh, as one irritated builder wrote to Sargon II uh, in a letter that's preserved, uh, the second-rate logs we have here are quite plentiful, but truly none of them will do for the job. They're of fur, and they're much too thin. I've tried them, but I've rejected them. If they'd been of cedar, I would have used them. So what, is the, what does this writer do? He covers his ass. The next thing, he instructs the king. Now, what are my lord the king's orders? If the king orders that these fur logs should be used, let my lord the king write specifically, and I will duly comply and give them over to the accounting of the palace superintendent. So if the, if, the wall, if the ceiling falls down, his ass is covered. That's the basic point. So what you need is cedar logs. Uh, and, and for a thousand years, monarchs praised themselves for going uh, first to Western Persia and subsequently to Lebanon to get the sea, to get the goods. A good year of Lagash 20, 40, 200 years ago makes a path into the cedar mountains, which nobody entered before. He cut its cedars with great axes. So, so Gilgamesh is in a long tradition here of doing what a, a monarch has to do. That's the imperial context of the quest for lumber. And this would be a special interest to any monarchs among the, among the audience. But most of the audience, let's say in Nineveh, wouldn't be themselves royalty. They would be members of the court. They would be scribes, administrators, bureaucrats, advisors to the king. And for them, a much more direct role model conveyor of a message is Enkidu. He's more like us, a professional managerial class. <clears throat> Uh, so, and, and what we see in the Cedar Forest episode, and again in the Ishtar episode, uh, is that Enkidu progressively fails in his role as the king's companion and counselor. He should be restraining the headstrong Gilgamesh uh, from going and attacking Humbaba, who is protected by the gods, who's set there by the great god Enlil. The, the wise men of his town say, don't do this. Enkidu himself says, yeah, I really we shouldn't really do this, but the headstrong king insists. Enkidu reluctantly agrees. And then Gilgamesh has a series of warning dreams. The gods send one dream after another saying, you really don't want to do this. And, and Gilgamesh doesn't know what to make of these dreams, uh, in which he's overwhelmed by a volcano, he's assaulted by a wild bull, a ferocious lion-headed eagle, uh, an axe uh, falls on him. His flesh is frozen with fear, and he asks Enkidu, what do all these dreams mean? And, and this is where Enkidu sets his own uh, path downwards. He falls into the classic temptation uh, of an autocrat's advisor. He tells Gilgamesh what he knows the king wants to hear. And in a series of completely ridiculous interpretations of the dream, he says, oh, well, uh, the, uh, they're going to bind the, the wings of the eagle-headed uh, lion, uh, the uh, lion-headed eagle. Uh, Gilgamesh himself must be the powerful bull, even though the bull is attacking him in the dream, completely contrary uh, to fact. When they reach the cedar forest, Enkidu becomes increasingly rash in his actions. And he's ruthless when they've, when they've captured Humbaba. The ogre pleads for mercy, saying he'll give them lavish gifts, and adding that he's protected by the great god Enlil, so watch out. Uh, but having, and having procured the desired timber and the glory of the victory, uh, Gilgamesh is inclined to spare Humbaba. And this is a real political issue. Do you, do you, what do you do with a conquered group? Do you destroy them or do you, do you, you know, co-opt them? Uh, and he's, he's inclined to, 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 uh, to spare him, but Enkidu intervenes. Instead of releasing their captive, Enkidu says they should murder him on the spot. Uh, as for Enlil's likely anger, that is simply a reason to act quickly. They should achieve a fait accompli ahead of the news cycle before the gods can hear. As he says to, to, to Gilgamesh, finish him, slay him, do away with this power before Enlil the foremost hears what we did. Establish forever a fame that endures. How Gilgamesh slew ferocious Humbaba. Gilgamesh follows Enkidu's advice and cuts off Humbaba's head, but not before the ogre has delivered uh, a fearsome curse. And Humbaba says, may the pair of them not grow old together. None shall bury Enkidu beside Gilgamesh's friend. So in developing the old adventure tale that goes back to Sumerian times of Gilgamesh and Humbaba, the epic poet has fashioned a resonant portrayal of the pressures facing a willful king's counselors, whether it is Gilgamesh and Enkidu or 
uh, uh, Colin Powell and George W. Bush. It goes on and on, telling the king what they want to hear. Uh, Enkidu progressively fails to measure up to the task, and his death will be the result. So from the point of view of many of the poems Near Eastern audience, as far as we could tell, let's say in Nineveh, where Ashurbanipal commissioned a copy of the Epic of Gilgamesh, the one with his name on it that, that you saw. Uh, if they listen to recital of the epic in the flickering torchlight of a banquet in the palace of Ashurbanipal in Nineveh, the Epic of Gilgamesh is only partly a tale of great king's heroism and his quest for immortality. For Ashurbanipal's counselors and advisors, the Epic of Gilgamesh was equally a cautionary tale, the tragedy of Enkidu. I follow with some aspects of the visual culture of ancient Mesopotamia, but also, as with David just now, leading forward, and as Andrew concluded, leading forward to our perception of ancient Mesopotamia. You will have noted that in the title to Andrew's first slide and then his thank you last slide, that he called the Epic of Gilgamesh the modern um, master, the, the modern piece of Babylonian poetry. And I would remind everybody in the audience as an archeologist that it may have been the masterpiece of Babylonian poetry, but remember how incomplete the archeological record is and the limitation of places we've excavated. And I'd like to leave open the possibility that other comparable epics may have existed and or that epics that entered into the vocabulary would have been part of a Babylonian experience or an Assyrian experience experience of their own literary world. In that respect, we have nothing quite similar to Homer's, the Homeric ethics, or to the, the Bible, particularly the Old Testament, to the extent that the cultures that produced them represented them and illustrated them over and over and over again. And it's quite, it's, it's challenging, but it's not so difficult to make comparable statements about the literary tradition and the visual tradition. With the Epic of Gilgamesh, however, is more challenging. There are a number of images that seem to refer to the epic visually, and I include three of them here um, because they appear on different media. That is, clay plaques is the upper left, one of which in color Andrew showed earlier um, in Berlin, um, and the other two, a cylinder seal at the bottom left and a stone relief from the site of Tel Halaf um, in northern Syria of the first millennium. So we're going from the second millennium BC at the upper left to the first millennium BCE in the bottom right. However, one of the things I found in looking for artistic representations, so-called identifiable with the epic, is the degree to which the same illustrations are used over and over and over again. And that's precisely because there are a limited number of such objects that can be related to the direct iconography scenes in representation in the text and then connected to representation visually. Now, many of those objects that represent happen to be clay plaques. And I show you a view of the Louvre um, current installation of clay plaques in a vitrine at the left. But then some of the kinds of images that we have, as Andrew has shown us partly, of faces that seem to reflect the text indicating Humbaba because we're told that his face is not unlike entrails unless you would um, translated differently these days, and one sees those very weird lines that look like no human face, but seem to coil around on themselves and possibly therefore represent the figure of Humbaba as he appears. Now the fact is, however, the one would wonder why the enemy, as it's called, of Gilgab the epic heroes, Gilgamesh and Enkidu, shows up individually on single plaques. And the only thing I can come up with with that is that it's not unlike the Gorgon head in Greek tradition to the extent that once dominated, then it becomes apotropaic in that it has its own power and Humbaba can be used against one's enemy like the evil eye, not unlike the Gorgon head on shields in the classical tradition. Nevertheless, the fact is that these epics-related images do appear in popular culture in less expensive clay plaques is important for us to think about. And then Andrew did show not only um, these heads, as I just showed you, but also this figure 
um, that's bandy-legged and seems to have another entrail-like head on him um, in a clay plaque, so that there are aspects of, of the Humbaba, if it is he, that have awkward, contorted bits of body or bowed legs that don't necessarily appear in the literary tradition. Now, at the same time, we do find individual plaques that once again get replicated over and over again as illustrations of the text, because it may or may not, but seems to represent Enkidu and the Bull of Heaven in the combat. So that there are a couple of images, this one in particular is one I'm very fond of, that may have walked out of the epic, but there is no narrative that gives us that part of the story, just the excerpt as you see it here. Now, at the same time, if you notice the, the figure that is going up against the up upside down bull, he seems to have wild curls in his hair and could be therefore a visual reflection of the wild man, Enkidu, who is not the king of Uruk or even the prince of Uruk before he comes back to become en the king of Uruk and ultimately represents the duality between the civilized man, Gilgamesh, and the wild man, Enkidu. In fact, there are many figures that seem to replicate that wild man with three hair curls that are doing things quite different in showing a flowing vase of abundance and not necessarily tied to imagery, verbal imagery in the epic. So we do not have guarantees that somebody who has three curls is always already Enkidu, but rather can represent a wild figure as our colleague Franz Wichermann has discussed in terms of a particular kind of heroic figure, but not necessarily walking out of the epic. Therefore, we come to that very first slide I showed you in that it is surprising to me that you go through the repertoire of images that seem to replicate aspects of scenes in the epic, the old Babylonian period, as up above here, seems to be better represented than the later periods of the Neo-Assyrian and the later North Syrian of the first millennium, when the epic itself has been constructed into this extraordinary literary composition with a beginning and a 12th tablet end that's almost symmetrical with what goes on as activity in the beginning and reminds me of Tsiabush and the Marduk hymn that he talked about a thousand years ago when we both were young, um, where that literary structure does include a beginning and an end that reflects in the narrative that goes in between. And yet, for the era in which Nimrud and the texts of the Assyrian version and Babylon and the later texts, um, where the text itself is complete or relatively complete, we have relatively few images. They may reflect the death of Humbaba and or Gilgamesh and Enkidu opposed to a monster-like creature that they are slaying jointly as here and there in the periphery of northern Syria. But again, we have very few images of the era that produce the finished poem. And so what Andrew's lectures last night and today have inspired me to do is to go back to that old Babylonian period and look at what's happening in the early redaction of the epic rather than in the later redaction of the epic that has its own agenda. And there I would argue with some of my Assyriological colleagues that the agenda of man's place and the human condition in the universe may be different in the first millennium from when the epic started out. And that the agenda of the epic when it began could have better, more to do with the ruler, potential ruler being tempered by life and experience to come home and be a good ruler, precisely because state and state formation was important and that that quest of the individual with respect to death and to life um, could be an adaptation of the attitude toward human existence in the first millennium, not necessarily going all the way back to the role of Uruk in early years of state formation in the fourth millennium and the third millennium BCE. Now, all of that is a way of saying that I do have one way in which we could make some progress on the relationship between the epic and the um, um, and imagery. And that comes out of a course that Peter Machinist and I taught jointly 
on representation in text and image at Harvard before he retired and I retired. And I bring you to the great stila of Naram Sin of Agade in the Akkadian period when there may well have been earlier incarnations of the epic already existing. And that has to do with the vocabulary that's used to describe the hero king in words in the epic, and in particular, those terms that show up over and over and over again about the able ruler being full of grace, well-built and constructed, alluring and radiant, those attributes that show up verbally, but then are applied in visual imagery later on, consistent with our notions of beauty. That as Andrew was saying today, many of the poetic lines show up in two opposite lines, of verses show up in two opposite lines, that very often attributes that are associated with auspiciousness, with beauty, with allure, end up as paired couplets in poetry, but also end up as paired aspects of attributes in the visual repertoire. And in this respect, Naram Sin, I think, has them all in that he's well-formed, he's full of allure, and he does all those things that a good ruler is supposed to do to radiate those aspects of rule that one wants to take away with one in terms of being a subject to the object who is the king. So I would say that the epic in its later form can resonate backwards in time as well as forwards in time, but has a lot to teach us. Thank you.